Mr. Chair, Rectora. First of all, may I thank Emma for a very generous and kind Lordesh. Ladies and gentlemen, we live in extraordinary and troubling times. Never before has the world been so prosperous. Never before have people lived such long and healthy lives. Never before have we witnessed such dazzling technology. And never before have we reached, on average, such levels of education. And yet, in absolute numbers, never before have so many people lived in poverty. Never before have so many died from preventable diseases. Never before has the planet been so threatened. And never before have so many people needed education. And it is education that fuels sustainable development education that is the most reliable way out of poverty, education that is fundamental to enlightened citizenship, to the peace and harmony, and even the continued life of our species on this planet. And the wonderful thing is that we do have the means for education for many, many more people. Not conventional education for the few, relatively speaking, who can travel the distances to physical sites of learning, more especially universities, that will remain the privilege of the few. But our science, our imagination, our technology, and our ingenuity have brought us now to a situation where we do have other means. There is now near universal satellite coverage. There is an internet which holds a vast and ever-growing stores of knowledge. We have learned much about pedagogy and how to teach and learn in this new environment. So it's an exciting time full of possibilities, possibilities way beyond the possibilities of any other time in our history. What we have invented in this new technology enables us to communicate with more people than ever before. And importantly for our academic purposes, allows many more people than before to be included in the knowledge production process. We now hear voices, world views that we didn't hear before. We share artifacts and artworks and museum pieces in ways that we didn't even short decades ago. As we speak, thousands of books and paintings and artifacts are being digitized. And this fact, together with the awesome computer power that we now can now summon, means that we can ask research questions that we couldn't ask before. We can search vast stores of knowledge which would have been humanly impossible to search before. And what this means is that we have to redefine what it is to be a scholar. And indeed, not only what technological skills and expertise we now need in our lives as active scholars, but also what we expect of our students at every level. The great issues of the world are complex and they are multifaceted. They're going to need the combined will and imagination of scholars everywhere to address them. Never before has collaborative learning, collaborative research and collaborative service been so necessary. In the process, we need to learn how to better share. Share our knowledge, share our technology, share our insights into learning in this new search in this new century, share our common wealth. And share we must, it seems to me. Each of us working on our own, in separate institutions, in different countries, on different continents, will take too long to reach the people that we need to reach. The people who need education and development so badly, wherever they may be. The open educational resource movement is a marvelous step in the right direction. A relatively small number of universities, I have to say, are putting up on the web, free to use, a vast number of courses as well as learning resources to help people negotiate their way through them. That's a good start, good example. The internet has made it possible, however, to reach many more people and indeed involve many more people, if only on a part-time basis. So each of us, each and every one of us, need to ask ourselves whether we are playing our part 
in making sure that we too, as individuals, are sharing and learning. We're fortunate indeed to live in such an extraordinary world with the means to communicate with so many people and find in the process that there's far more that bi than that binds us together in our common humanity than will ever divide us. Find also that we can make individual contributions to the causes that we all em embrace. So each of us has a part to play. I would also argue at this time the traditional ways of teaching and learning do not con constitute sufficient mobilization for the task at hand. In particular, I think we need to interrogate our community uh, outreach activities and integrate them into the teaching and learning experience of our students and scale them up. We should look on initiatives in various communities that could act on the change agenda. And the most important of these, in my opinion, is what has come to be known as service learning, a movement which seeks to engage students in the real world, real work in communities, both local and further afield, in an attempt to not only locate learning, but also to emphasize the importance and even the necessity of students becoming involved in making the world a better place. The growth of the NGO sector is one of the great trends of our time, as more and more people come to realize that governments are not always able to solve local problems. Indeed, as Daniel Bell once famously observed, the national state has become too small for the big problems in life and too big for the small problems. Now, many of us are familiar with initiatives in some universities which involve students in community efforts that relate directly to their professions. Law students running legal aid clinics, medical students running community medicine clinics, accountancy students running tax clinics or financial aid clinics, and so on. But it seems to me that these should hardly be voluntary. Whatever they are, the fact is universities should be emphasizing the importance of voluntary work and creating possibilities for all its students to pursue them. One such initiative is the Talwa Network, an international collector, collective of individuals and institutions committed to civic engagement and harnessing the power of community in students worldwide. The network now has 185 members from 59 countries and nearly 6 million students throughout the world. It represents an understanding that the issues in the world today require mobilization at scale. And such mobilization should be seen as one of the responsibilities of universities. What other world institutions have the collective sense of mission and purpose? The prospect of a very large network representing thousands of staff and millions of students throughout the world has huge possibilities. It's also important as a symbol of what is appropriate for these times. And it is a fundamental learning ex experience for our students who will never again be able to say that they don't know how that they as individuals can make a difference in this complex world. And so my hope is, ladies and gentlemen, that we exploit the potential of the new technologies and embrace the education opportunities rendered possible by them, but also the networks that they have spawned. And we do so in the conscious knowledge that they may well be central to the solution of many of the problems facing us in the 21st century. This generation will collectively determine whether, we, whether life as we know it on our planet will survive or not. As educators, we have a critical role in fostering, supporting, encouraging, and above all, equipping our students with the values and the skill sets necessary to drive forward such initiatives. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm honored by the Open University of Catalonia. I thank the university for that acknowledgement. If I've been able to play even a small role in the world of education, I count that as a privilege, as indeed I count it as a privilege to live in these amazing times. My only wish is that I had done more.
Ara sentirem unes paraules que ens ha enviat una institució acadèmica i que ens ha demanat que féssim arribar a la Brenda. Rectora, distinguished authorities, doctors and Professor Goulet, I am delighted to be able to offer this message of congratulations to Professor Goulet from the Open University in Milton Keynes, England, on this very special occasion. When Professor Goulet arrived at the Open University in January 2002, she came to us fresh from the challenges of leading the University of Natal for the previous eight years, where she had risen from part-time tutor to become vice-chancellor. It speaks volumes about her strength of character that her time at Natal had followed an early career in the profession of accountancy in South Africa, the only woman in what was then a totally male-dominated occupation. As we all know, South Africa underwent huge transformations during that period, and Professor Goulet had been operating in an environment where divisions run deep and decisions could quite literally be matters of life and death. She brought to the OU her own qualities of high intellect, impatience with the pace of change, a wicked sense of humor, and the ability to say difficult things in the most direct way. She also made sure that the OU was fully connected with the outside world and preparing itself for what that uncertain world might hold for us in the future. She reminded us that social justice is too important to be a sentimental issue. It involves hard choices and hard decisions. That diversity is as much about how you think as about how you look. That diversity of opinion is valuable. That leadership is as much about listening as telling. In the UK, higher education may shrink in the next few years, but in the world as a whole, a thirst for learning far outstrips the growth in supply from traditional institutions. Professor Goulet reinvigorated our international role and moved us from a parochial to a world view. She brought us world-leading thinkers to inspire our ideas and transform our strategic planning. And through initiatives like our OpenLearn platform, she consolidated our position as a world leader in open and distance learning. But she also recognized that the Open University is a great machine, and she did not neglect the need to pay attention to its operations, its risks, its processes, and its financial health. Professor Goulet has also found time over the years to serve as a member of many boards, associations and trusts, both in the public and private sectors, that further the cause of education. This is by no means her first award or public accolade, but I am sure that you will appreciate that retirement from the OU has certainly not meant any slowing in her frantic pace. On a personal note, Professor Goulet took time to share many wise and invaluable words with me when handing over the reins of the OU and has continued to show me great support and kindness. Professor Goulet, on behalf of your former colleagues and many friends at this institution where your huge influence is still felt, I would like to offer our congratulations on this richly deserved award and send you our very best wishes for a wonderful occasion in Spain today. Ara cantarem l'himne nacional de Sud-Àfrica, des que va ser elegit Nelson Mandela president. We will now do Nkosi Sikeleli Africa. <laughs> Così sì che l'eli Africa, ma lo paga mi supondo al guaio, ai suoi mi tanda zoie tu, così sì che l'ella tina lo sapo al guaio, così sì che l'eli Africa. Malu paga mi su puno luayo, ai zwa imitanda zo ye tu, kozi si kelela, tina, luz 
Rosa Polvaio Rosa Moyen Sì che le lan così sì che le Morena Poluca se chava sa esu, u fedi se dintu ali mantuene o. Morena Poluca se chava sa esu, u fedi se dintu ali mantuene o. Si Poluca o, si Poluca o si Poluca. Yeah, too, say Jabasa, Saudade.